Hello, thank you. Yes. Yes, why not? Well, it's quite an intimate room. That's lovely. Um, my name is Astrid Williamson. It's wonderful to be part of the celebration of Christopher Logue. Um, I'm going to sing a song that uh, was in the film Poor Cow by uh, Ken Loach, and it's called Be Not Too Hard. to Astrid Williamson for that wonderful uh, beginning to this afternoon's proceeding. It's great to have us with you, Astrid, with us, Astrid. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Rachel Foss, uh, and I'm head of Contemporary Archives and Manuscripts at the British Library. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone this afternoon to the library for this event, uh, the arrival of the poet in the library, a celebration of Christopher Logue. As many of you uh, will know, this year marks the 10th anniversary of Christopher Logue's death and offers a, an ideal opportunity to look back on his life, his work and his legacy. An audio book of his own recorded reading of his best known work, War Music, a retelling of the Iliad that he worked on over a period of 45 years, has just been released by Blackstone Publishing. Uh, the audiobook uh, was released in digital format uh, via Audible on the 23rd of November and is available exclusively there for 90 days. It's going to be released on CD to all retailers and libraries on the 2nd of February next year. So the CD copies, and apologies for the merchandise plug this early on, but the CD copies on sale today that you'll find in the stall outside in the auditorium are advanced copies which are exclusively available to you um, as attendees of this event. So I urge you to visit our stall when you leave. You'll find also books and posters of Christopher's works available there too. We're also celebrating the arrival of the poet in the library in a very particular sense. 
I'm delighted to announce that uh, Christopher Logue's archive has just been acquired by the British Library and it arrived in our building earlier this week, in fact. It is a real honour and a privilege for us to be able to offer a permanent home for this wonderful collection, which inclu includes the phenomenally detailed notebooks and drafts relating to war music, alongside uh, personal and business correspondence, diaries and annotated books. The archive joins the library's ever-growing collections of contemporary literary archives uh, alongside other acquisitions such as the archives of Heathcote Williams, Bob Cobbing and Barry Miles and related collections within our sound archive, web archive and contemporary publications. It's a very fitting arrival and a very welcome one. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Rosemary Hill for entrusting the archive to the library's care for all of her commitments to the library throughout the process of acquisition and for all the time and effort uh, that both Rosemary and Lawrence Ashton have dedicated towards making today's event a success. Uh, we're hugely grateful uh, for Rosemary's friendship and Lawrence's too and we're looking forward to deepening our, uh, that friendship with her as we work to make the archive available to everyone for research, inspiration and enjoyment in the months ahead. The acquisition would not have been possible without the generous support of the British Library's Collections Trust, uh, and I'd like to extend my thanks to all of the trustees for their untiring work on the library's behalf. It's a particular pleasure that we're, that we're in the excellent hands of Andrew O'Hagan for uh, uh, this afternoon. Andrew is going to be our MC. Andrew is a distinguished writer and journalist and a contributing editor to the London Review of Books and to Granta magazine. He was nominated by Granter uh, as one of the 20 best young British novelists. His recent, recent novels are The Life and Opinions of Math the Dog and of his friend Marilyn Monroe, published in 2010. The Illuminations, published in 2015, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. And his most recent novel is Mayflies. So welcome again to all of you. I think we're in for a fascinating afternoon. And I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Astrid. We'll be hearing uh, more from Astrid uh, later on when I'll take the opportunity then to introduce her properly. Uh, I'm Andrew O'Hagan. I'm editor-at-large of the London Review of Books. Uh, I think it's fair to say, or perhaps not unduly unfair to say, that the LRB has always had a rather eccentric relationship to poetry. Apart from anything else, we have long believed in the blue pencil and many a distinguished poet has expressed surprise, shall we say, when the edits are offered um, of their much beloved and soon perhaps to be published poem. I remember Seamus Heaney's chuckle of acceptance when Carl Miller, the then co-editor, suggested the word chatter should be used instead of, uh, sorry, the word blether should be used instead of the word chatter. Uh, it related to the noise made by Scottish sheep on a hillside, by the way. Uh, I remember me having to impart the news, other news, to a grand young poet that his poem was better if we removed the last line. But the paper liked the poems of Christopher Logue. It published several fragments of war music and both the seriousness and the musicality of the work uh, was of a kind the editors liked. The reviewers in the paper were not always so keen, it has to be said, among adults. A certain Yale professor losing his wig over war music, not once, but twice. But that's the sort of thing that happens in literary papers, and Christopher never seemed particularly bothered. He was a valued and admired contributor for many years. He had undertaken the war music project at the suggestion of D Donald Carn Ross, who was commissioning a version of the Iliad for the BBC. Logue's plan, and I quote him, was to retain the storyline, but to cut or amplify or add to its incidents, to vary certain of its similes, and mostly to omit Homer's descriptive epithets. There's a high modernist brio to the work, to all of his work, I think, and it's a living poem, an imitation of sorts, war music, 
full of quote, interpretation, paraphrase, and a lot of Christopher's work will be remembered for its aliveness and the definite pulse of his own time. His place in post-war British literary life, to say nothing of journalistic and political life, is assured. And the arrival of the poet in the library is a testament to that. In an era of soft careerism, if you'll allow me that phrase, we might admire the blaze and the individuality of a writer such as Christopher Logue. He was a one-off, and you'll see today in full amplitude what that means. Ian Wilson once described Christopher as a sophisticated bohemian who rejoices in the fact that he has never had a job. But he did have one. It was perhaps to remind us overall in an almost 18th century way that good writers work from the core of their own genius and never do they cut their conscience to suit the fashion of the times. So we're off. Let me introduce the first piece of film. In the early days of Channel 4, Christopher and the filmmaker and writer Rick Stroud came up with a series called Edible Gold, in which at the end of each evening, a poem, a passage from Shakespeare, or some other sort, short literary piece would be read by Christopher as the words went up on the screen, like film credits. It was an alternative to the national anthem, which the BBC, as many of you will know, used to play at the end of their schedule. I should say, by way of sidebar, that in Scottish households at that time, Scottish Catholic households in particular, there'd be a rush to the television to switch it off as soon as the Queen came on. But that's perhaps a story for another occasion. In that series, Christopher included his own poem, Gone Ladies. Here it is. Gone Ladies, a version of the Ballad of Ladies from Former Times by Francois Villon. Where in the world is Helen gone, whose loveliness demolished Troy? Where is Salome? Where the wan, licentious queen of Avalon? Who sees my lady Fontenoy? And where is Joan, so soldier tall? And she who bore God's only boy? Where is the snow we watched last fall? Is Ty still? Is Nell? And can stem Eloise Aurine, who so by love enchanted man sooner would risk castration than abandon her, be seen? Who does Shahrazad enthrall? And who, within her arms and small, lies hard by Josephine? Through what eventless territory are Lady's Day and Joplin swept? What news of Marilyn who crept into an endless reverie? You saw Lucrece and Jane, and she, salvation's ancient blame-it-all, delicious Eve. Then answer me, where is the snow we watched last fall? Girl, never seek to know from me who was the fairest of them all. What wouldst thou say if I asked thee? Where is the snow we watched last fall? Our next speaker, Christopher Reed, is well known as a poet and an editor. His A Scattering, written in memory of his wife, Lucinda Gain, won the Costa Award in 2009, the first poetry book to win the overall award since Seamus Heaney. A poetry editor at Faber, he oversaw the final posthumous edition of Logue's Homer poem, War Music, which appeared in 2015, bringing together the fragments of what would have been its final part to be called Big Men Falling a Long Way. Everyone, Christopher Reed.
I first met Christopher over dinner at the house of a friend. He came with his wife, Rosemary Hill, whom I already knew. I came with my wife, Lucinda. We seemed, he and the two of us, to hit it off, and all his likeable qualities, the humour and the charm, were on display. Only towards the end of the evening, Lucinda and Christopher fell into an argument of deeply entrenched positions. Over the years that followed, I grew to expect the point in a dinner party at which Christopher would say something provocative or preposterous, then battle out the consequences with whoever felt the need to contradict him. His voice rose in volume. He would bang the table, and all his bonhomie seemed to evaporate. He was clearly fond of an argument and took the job seriously. But so, as he found on this occasion, did Lucinda. What was the argument about? I simply don't recall. It scarcely mattered. The time came to leave. Nobody was upset. And Lucinda and I went home, delighted to have made an interesting new friend. Quite early next morning, the phone rang and I picked it up. It was Christopher, who, without preamble, blurted out, All I want to say to you is that I regard Lucinda as a very good thing. <laughs> then, before I could reply, he put the phone down. <laughs> My own explanation for this was that Rosemary had insisted he call and apologise for his behaviour of the night before, <laughs> but that he'd been thrown off balance by reaching me rather than Lucinda herself. Well, I was utterly charmed, as was she when I passed the message on. How could we not be? There was so much grace and gallantry in that simple statement, and we had no idea he meant it. Not everyone took to him in this way. I know people who found Christopher just too abrasive, too ferocious. He could appear downright rude. Our present poet laureate told me years ago of a moment when Christopher approached him after a poetry reading. Simon, he said, you're a very good poet, but you have to do something about that boring voice of yours. <laughs> Luckily, Simon found that the charm outweighed whatever offence he might have felt. Now, charm is an extremely different, difficult quality to measure or analyse. I have been puzzling over the matter in the last week or two while rereading Christopher's work in preparation for this brief talk. His memoir, Prince Charming, which happens to be one of the books I edited, presents the paradox in its clearest form because while it reveals many of the author's worst foibles and failings, the title proves thoroughly apt. How come? I think the answer may be twofold. First, the sheer candour of the narrative, the author's refusal to extenuate or find quibbling excuses for the more dislikable qualities he feels bound to confess there. It's brave and winning. He is as tough as could be on his past self and emerges the stronger for it. There is something heroic in his struggle to survive the worst in his own character. Besides that, though, there is the singular artistic achievement. I know of no other book in the autobiographical line that allows so much room for voices and views that are not the author's own. The effect is sometimes almost choral as he goes about soliciting the memories and judgments of those who knew him well in bygone days, some with very harsh and unforgiving accounts of how he behaved towards them. This quasi-choral treatment meant that great care had to be taken as we prepared the book for the printer to get the counterpoint of voices clearly audible. And much of my input was concerned with disentangling overcomplicated sentences and paragraphs so compacted that they made things hard to follow. By the way, the late Michael Horowitz once confided to me that he had asked Christopher how our editorial relationship worked. Allegedly, the answer was, he puts lots of commas in, then I take them out again, <laughs> which may be one way of describing it. Originality of technique in this instance seems to me to match 
one of the most significant features of Christopher's artistic practice. That is his ability, or should I say, need to collaborate with others. He managed this, moreover, without sacrificing any of his own strong artistic personality. From early days in Bournemouth, when he was desperate to seek out the company of young men as fanatical about literature as he was, he flourished best when joining forces. His major friendships in Paris were centred on the avant-garde magazine Merlin, necessarily a collective endeavour. Returning to England, he found the Royal Court Theatre under George Devine, a hospital, hospitable and nourishing place to write. When the campaign for nuclear disarmament started, he gave himself energetically to that. His celebrated poster poems required artistic engagement with printers. He turned out film scripts for Ken Russell and acted in his films. His appearance at Horowitz's first great international poetry reading in the Albert Hall in 1965 was a public declaration of sympathy with a rebellious new poetic movement. And with a group of young British mus musicians, he tried out the possibility of marrying poetry to jazz. All these developments are recounted alongside the ups and downs and twists and turns of his private life in Prince Charming. They give the unmistakable impression of a man trying to find out where he truly belonged. Artistically, his arrival at that longed for place is marked by his discovery of Homer's Iliad. As Andrew has just said, he was led to it by two classicists who happened to be working at the BBC, Xanthi Wakefield and Donald Kahn Ross. With much patient coaching, they got him started on the passage from Book 21 of the Iliad, the description of Achilles' fight with the River Scamander that was duly broadcast in June 1959, with Christopher himself reading it. You have to ask why they chose this passage in the first place and why Christopher eventually took to it with such relish. I can only speculate, but I can't help wondering if it wasn't the near impossibility of picturing a human warrior in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a raging river that was the challenge he needed. It seems to me that many of the most exhilarating episodes in war music are those that attempt the outlandish and all but intractable. I'll give just one instance from Husbands, the only war music book that I had an editorial hand in. Incidentally, scholars consulting the newly acquired archive. Ah! I'm missing a page. Oh, sorry, we'll certainly have better things to do than to identify the commas that I put in for Christopher to remove, but his willingness to consider advice from editors, notably my predecessor at Faber Craigrain and Paul Keegan, who followed me, may strike them as yet another aspect of his openness to collaboration. Anyhow, back to Homer. And the crucial moment when Helen's rival husbands, the Greek Menelaos and the Trojan Paris, meet face to face in the field. Things come to a head when things come to a head when Paris throws his spear at his enemy but misses. This should give Menelaos the chance to finish him off. Only Aphrodite, who supports the Trojans, cannot allow it to happen. Let me take it from the point at which Menelaus' spear, spear strikes Paris's shield. As the 18-inch head hits fair Paris' shield and knocks him backwards through the air, bent like a gangster in his barber's chair, then thrusts on through that round and pins it, plus his sword arm to the sand, the Greek is over him, sword high and screaming, now you believe me, now you understand. Smashing the edge down, right, left, right, on either side of Paris' face, and that's the stuff, that's the stuff, pretty to watch, Queen Hera and Athene shout as Paris' mask goes left, goes right, and from the mass, off with his cock, off with his cock, right, left, and on the wall, God kill him, 
Helen to herself, as Menelaos, happy now, raises his sword to give the finishing stroke, and cheering, 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 down it comes and shatters on Lord Paris' mask. No problem. A hundred of us pitch our swords to him. Yet, even as they flew, their blades changed into wings, their pommels into heads, their hilts to feathered chests, and what were swords were turned to doves, a swirl of doves, and waltzing out of it in oyster silk, running her tongue around her strawberry lips while repositioning a spaghetti shoulder strap, the Queen of Love, Our Lady Aphrodite, touching the massive Greek aside with one pink fingertip and with her other hand lifting Lord Paris up, big as he was, in his bronze bodice, heavy as he was, setting him on his feet, lacing his fingers with her own, then leading him, hidden in wings, away. There's so much here that is characteristic of war music, from the literary marvellous, given as realistic and vivid a rendering as the poet can contrive, to the brutality of the fighting, which has as much excitement as any cin cinematic battle scene, to those special Logian touches of impertinent anachronism, like the gangster in the barber's chair and Aphrodite's shoulder strap. Perhaps less prominent, but slipped in here and there throughout the poem, is the quiet first-person plural. A hundred of us pitch our swords to him, by which the poet places himself as one of many in the midst of the action. He is not just the narrator, he is a participant. This is where he belongs, imaginatively, as he never did when he served in the British Army in Palestine, but was denied the experience of actual combat in the field. The compulsion to get closer to war, to understand it better in all its human and bigger than human aspects, must have been what drove him. It certainly what makes war music such an urgent and overpowering piece of work. And it was Homer, his ultimate collaborator, the greatest of them all, and the most astutely chosen, who allowed him to do it. Thank you so much, Christopher. Harriet Walter is one of our greatest actors. Her film appearances include Sense and Sensibility, Atonement, The Young Victoria, The Sense of an Ending, and most recently, The Last Duel. On the box, we have seen her in Downton Abbey, The Crown, Patrick Melrose, Succession, Killing Eve. There's too many to mention. Harriet began her career in 1974 and made her Broadway debut in 1983. She won the Olivier in 1998 and has been a, had had a huge number of successes with the RSC and many other companies receiving a Tony Award nomination for Best Actress. She also plays Prospero in The Tempest as part of an all-female Shakespeare trilogy in 2016. To read from War Music, please welcome Harriet Walter. My life crossed over with Christopher's at uh, one very memorable for me six months in 1980 when we were doing Hamlet at the Royal Court with Jonathan Price. And uh, Richard Eyre had the rather inspirational idea to have Christopher play the player king and write his own version of the Paris and the Hecuba stories. And he did it with that. He sort of used to be a bit nervous about the acting. And I said, well, you, you speak your poetry so brilliantly. You know, there's no difference between acting and what you do. And um, so I'm going to try, and I hope you'll remember his own gravelly, sort of snarly, but um, passionate voice um, when I read this extract. Now I shall ask you to imagine how men under discipline of death prepare for war. There is much more to it than armament and kicks from those who could not catch an hour's sleep waking the ones who dozed like rows of spoons. 
all those with everything to lose, the kings, asleep like pistols in red velvet. Moments like these absolve the needs dividing men. Whatever caught and brought and kept them here is lost. And for a while they join a terrible equality. Our virtuous, self-sacrificing, free. And so insidious is this liberty that those surviving it will bear an even greater servitude to its root. Believing they were whole while they were brave. That they were rich because their loot was great that war was meaningful because they lost their friends. They rise, the Greeks with smiling iron mouths. They are like nature, like a mass of flame, great lengths of water struck by changing winds, a forest of innumerable trees, boundless sand, snowfall across broad steppes at dusk. As a huge beast stands and turns around itself, the well-fed glittering army stands and turns. Nothing can happen till Achilles wakes. He wakes. Those who have slept with sorrow in their hearts know all too well how short but sweet the instant of their coming to can be. The heart is strong as if it never sorrowed the mind's dear clarity intact, and then the vast unhappy stone from yesterday rolls down these vital units to the bottom of oneself. Achilles saw his armour in this moment, and its ominous radiance flooded his heart. Bright pads with toggles crossed behind the knees, bodies of fitted tungsten, pliable straps, his shield as round and rich as moons in spring, his sword's haft parked between sheaves of grey obsidian, from which a lucid blade stood out, leaf-shaped, adorned with running spirals. And for his head, a welded cortex, yes. Though it is noon, the helmet screams against the light, scratches the eye, so violent it can be seen across three thousand years. Achilles stands. He stretches, turns on his heel, punches the sunlight, bends, then jumps and lets the world turn fractionally beneath his feet. Noon. In the foothills, melons emerge from their green hidings heat. He walks towards the chariot. Greece waits. Over the wells in Troy, mosquitoes hover. Beside the chariot, leading the sacred horses, watching his this day's driver, Automedon, cinch, shake out the reins and lay them on the rail. Dapple and white the horses are. Perfect they are sneezing to clear their cool black muzzles. He mounts. The chariot's basket dips, the whip fires in between the horse's ears, and as in dreams, or at Cape Kennedy, they rise. Slowly, it seems, their chests like royals. Yet behind them in a double plume, the sand curls up is barely dented by their flying hooves and wheels that barely touch the world and the wind slams shut behind them. Fast as you are, Achilles says, when twilight makes the armistice, take care you don't leave me behind as you left my Patroclus. And as it ran, the white horse turned its tall face back and said, Prince, this time we will, this time we can, but this time cannot last. And when we leave you, not for dead, but dead, God will not call us negligent as you have done. And Achilles, shaken, says, 
I know I will not make old bones. And laid his scourge against their racing flanks. Someone has left a spear stuck in the sand. Thank you, Harry. What a treat. I first came across Tariq Ali in 1984. I was 16 with his book, Who's Afraid of Margaret Thatcher? I loved it and I discovered more, lots more. Books about Pakistan, Chile and the Stalinist legacy. Books about Bush, resistance and his street fighting years. His beautiful novels, the Islam Quintet. As the years went on, tackling Obama, Kashmir, he has been a guiding light at the New Left Review and for many years a great contributor to the LRB. He and Christopher were allies in the political scene in the 1960s and worked together on Black Dwarf. Here he is, Tariq Ali. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say before discussing Christopher and his work in some detail, that he belongs to a tradition in English radicalism and poetry which has existed for a very long time. People tend to forget because there's not too much of it these days or for the last 30 or 40 years, but uh, there was a period in English history, when Cromwell's chief of staff, he would be called now, but also foreign secretary, head of the intelligence services, John Thurlow, used to discuss all the intelligence reports coming in about the plots against the English Revolution that were maturing in Europe. And sitting around Thurlow's table every Monday morning, were John Milton, Dryden, Andrew Marvel, discussing the documents, analyzing them, uh, discussing with each other, notes being taken and moving on. That was a period, of course, when a lot of poets and pamphleteers uh, were, if not part of the English revolutionary tradition, certainly sympathetic to it. And the next phase, of course, uh, as we know, came years later, uh, um, hundreds of years later, with the Romantics, who were also extremely political, including Keats, uh, and uh, who dominated the literary scene, Keats, Shelley, uh, Byron. And I would say that Christopher uh, himself comes very much from that tradition of reacting to events, of seeing the world uh, as it is, as it's going on, and linking it to past events. And that's how war music emerged. Um, Christopher used to send out little folios of it to friends, and I was privileged enough to receive all of them till the book was actually published in complete stroke, in complete version, an unfinished masterpiece. And if you read war music, as I had occasion to do uh, a few weeks ago for a radio, before a radio show, it's incredibly striking and it hits you very hard how quite a lot of the descriptions. Already Christopher is writing this book at a time when a huge ugly war is waging in Southeast Asia. The Americans are pulverizing Vietnam, uh, uh, bombing it every day. And this war affects everyone, not just in the States, but all over, because it's the first time a war has been televised. And you see the bombs dropping, and you see the napalm, kids burning with napalm, rushing across. And you see American journalists actually losing it on screen in live reports. I'll never forget Morley Safer reporting for CBS and saying, describing 
flamethrowers being used to burn a whole village, burning women and children coming out, being killed, mowed down. And Morley Safer says, and this is what we are told is what fighting for freedom and democracy means. So there were courageous journalists in the United States then, and uh, some in this country too, who reported the war um, as it was. So this was the atmosphere, generally the political atmosphere, in which Christopher was composing and writing war music. And it didn't fail to have an impact on him. And in fact, there are references, not so directly, but indirect references to it, as there are direct references to uh, the anti-fascist struggle during the Second World War. You read a line and suddenly Christopher mentions El Alamein, the Battle of El Alamein. So it's a great poem, not simply in reminding us of uh, what the um, Iliad was, but also linked to what is going on today. And at the 40-year war in Afghanistan, futile, useless war that has just come to an end, there are, of course, uh, there's no references to it as such, but you can read references to what war does to a people. And that is what gives uh, the poem its universality and its strength and its power. And I think it's one of those universal poems about war which will, which will be around for a long, long time. I know, and I've said this before, that there were many young people who had never read or even heard of the Iliad, who after reading war music went to read the original and learned a great deal about how ballads were written, about how poetry was constructed, how what the oral tradition meant in societies. And there is an element of that, that you can read the poem, but it really comes to life when it is being read aloud, as we heard in Harriet's rendering and Christopher's own powerful renderings of it uh, in the past. Now, I first met Christopher in 1967. There was a very wonderful literary agent a literary television agent in London called Clive Goodwin, a friend of many of ours who got the idea one day to call a meeting of uh, political activists, left-wing journalists, playwrights, um, poets to discuss launching a political cultural magazine, which he said we really need. And Christopher was very prominent in that. Who else was there at the first meeting? Uh, Christopher, Adrian Mitchell, uh, uh, David Mercer, Sheila Robotham, um, myself, Clive. And Clive just said, we've got to launch a magazine. How we were going to raise the money, we had no idea. And what was the name of the magazine going to be? We said we didn't want a boring, staid old name like Socialist Standard or this, that, and the other. And Christopher said, over my dead body. Uh, so he went and spent a day at the British Library. So it's quite nice that this event is taking place in the British Library. And he came back the following week and said, I've got it. I have just found it, and there is no other name that is possible. <laughs> so we said, what is it? He said, the black dwarf. So everyone gasped, oh, Christopher. And I, I still can hear his voice saying, this magazine was set up by Thomas Wooler in 1819. There you go. In Bishopsgate. And it's called the Black Dwarf because it was designed to be read by miners. And they were stunted, working in the pits, and their faces were black when they came out after work because of the soot. And the, so the title could have been The Miner, but Wooler called it The Black Dwarf. And at the very top of it, 
and this also appealed to Christopher, uh, every issue had a quote from Alexander Pope at the top, which reads, satire's my weapon, but I'm too discreet to run amok and tilt at all I meet. I only wear it in a land of hectares, thieves, supercargoes, and directors. <laughs> Still pretty relevant. Uh, and so we, we didn't have this then, but we had Christopher's verbal account of it. And so we all decided, let's call it the Black Dwarf, and we'll explain why, which we did in a big uh, uh, broadsheet. And it was great fun and joy, actually, the first year, working on it and trying to raise money, which we got. There was, uh, I remember, we had uh, people, Clive was very good at that, a whole bunch of artists, uh, Hockney, Kitai, and gang came in, and Clive used to have a big checkbook, the Black Dwarf checkbook. And I remember, I think, both Keita and Hockney said, we can't, we don't have much money at the moment, but we'll give you a painting. So we got the paintings and then auctioned them, and that kept us going for about six or seven months. And there was a general sympathy in the culture for a critical view <clears throat> and for a break with the 50s, if you like and uh, uh, all the pedantry associated uh, with that. And I also remember Christopher stressing history at that meeting and saying, he said this, this magazine is very modern in many ways. Uh, it was in 1819, and he said there's a letter in which he'd found, uh, which was a letter from a, a lady saying, it's now 10 years since Tom Paine died, and I'm looking for a letter which is still commonly published, and I'm looking for information, personal memories, documents, etc., to write a biography of Tom Paine. And uh, Christopher said, that is our tradition, you know, radical democracy, which these people will never give us, and fight and fight and, and, and fight. And <clears throat> he often shocked people, including young men and women who were from a, you know, a different generation to him, by the anger uh, with which he expressed himself sometimes and the images that he conjured in terms of suggesting what should be on the cover on, uh, or not. And I want to uh, read a poem he wrote. And you know, whereas war music, as, as we all know, took a long time to write and was never finished. Uh, uh, and who knows if it ever would have been finished. But uh, Christopher was also capable of coming up with a poem just like that. You know, sitting at a typewriter and typing it up. And this is how he typed out. I remember very vividly, he came into the office once uh, with a, holding a piece of paper. And he said, that's for the next issue. So I said, before we t talk about it, I hadn't read it as yet. I said, Christopher, I have to tell you a story. A woman came into the office. Uh, she's an artist. She's a potter from Wales. And she gave us a check for 250 pounds and said she could do this regularly. Uh, 250 pounds in 1968 was a lot of money for us you know, raising funds for the paper. And she'd come all the way from Wales to give it to us. And he said, well, I'm very glad, but why are you telling me? I said, because when I asked her, why, I said, thank you very much, but why are you giving us this money? She said, Christopher Logue saved my life. Christopher then went into a reverie, saying, where did, uh, did you not, uh, I said, yeah, we asked her further, and she said that he was, she was uh, in the south of France on one of the corniches, looking at the sea, and she was thinking of jumping. And she said, two guys came on a motorbike, one of them was Christopher, stopped, 
And she said, Christopher Lowe came and talked me out of it. Now, I said, Christopher, this is a very noble thing you did. And he said, I can't remember it at all. <laughs> so I said, well, that's fine. But, you know, I won't say that to her because she's promised us 250 pounds a month. <laughs> So, uh, uh, <clears throat> I've just remembered her name, Fiona Armour Brown. And um, funnily enough, I wrote a piece in the LRB where I mentioned this episode. Uh, and uh, I got a letter from her saying, Dear Tariq, I'm still alive. Are you 100% sure that I told you I was thinking of committing suicide? Well, I was 100% sure, because it was something very striking. She said, I'm not so sure whether it was as straightforward. In any case, what happened was that Christopher pulled her back from the brink in a very literal sense. The piece of paper he had in his hand uh, was a poem. And he'd done a rough design of it as well. And the poem was called Know Thy Enemy. And he said to me, I wrote this yesterday. And it went into the issue of the Black Two of the next week. And it is like this. That's Christopher's design. Know thy enemy. He does not care what color you are, provided you work for him. He does not care how much you earn, provided you earn more for him. He does not care who lives in the room at the top, provided he owns the building. He will let you say whatever you like against him, provided you do not act against him. He sings the praises of humanity, but knows machines cost more than men. Bargain with him, he laughs and beats you at it. Challenge him, and he kills Sooner than lose the things he owns, he will destroy the world. Know thy enemy. <clears throat> That's my part. I'm now going to just briefly introduce another poem by Christopher called Why I Shall, Be, Why I Shall Vote Labour. In 1966, Tribune magazine, then edited by Michael Foote, a literary type and an old member of parliament, uh, asked people who were broadly speaking sympathetic, even very critical of labor, to contribute either an essay or a poem or something, and Christopher was asked. And he did toy with the idea of writing a sort of typical left poem. Uh, you know, about the poverty and this, that, and the other, but finally, uh, this is what came out, and it's a poem which has been recited so many times at meetings and uh, book fairs and uh, literary festivals and political events for the last, since he wrote it, because it never gets out of, goes out of date, especially the last sentence. And then... Um, it will last as long as the Labour Party does, I think. But enjoy it. I shall vote Labour. I shall vote Labour because God votes Labour. I shall vote Labour in order to protect the sacred institution of the family. I shall vote Labour because I am a dog. I shall vote Labour because upper class hoorays annoy me in expensive restaurants. I shall vote Labour because I am on a diet. I shall vote Labour because if I don't, somebody else will. And I shall vote Labour because if one person does it, everyone will be wanting to do it. I shall vote Labour because if I do not vote Labour, my balls will drop off. I shall vote Labour because there are too few cars on the road. I shall vote Labour because I am a hopeless drug addict. I shall vote Labour because I failed to be a dollar millionaire aged three. I shall vote Labour because Labour will build more maximum security prisons. 
I shall vote Labour because I want to shop in an all-weather precinct stretching from Yeovil to Glasgow. I shall vote Labour because the Queen's stamp collection is the best in the world. I shall vote Labour because, deep in my heart, I am a Conservative. The eagle-eyed will have noticed that some changes occurred, changes often occurred. Uh, Christopher, what you saw up on the screen was different from what was recorded. Thank you very much, Tarek. <laughs> Our next speaker, George Nicholson, is a composer and a professor emeritus of music at Sheffield University. His collaboration with Christopher came about in 1983 as a commission from Durham University for a piece to be programmed with Stravinsky's The Soldier's Tale. It tells the story of a young poet making his way to the city. Logue has always enjoyed collaboration with musicians. His poetry and jazz record, Red Bird, versions of poems by Neruda, came out in 1959. The arrival has an epigram from the composer Hans Eisler. The words are primary and the music is not secondary. George Nicholson. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Rosemary for adopting the title of our piece uh, for today's event. That's very flattering, very nice. What you see here is actually um, the original text of the Arrival of the Poet in the City, which Christopher uh, first, of, first of all, conceived as a film treatment, and it, it didn't lead to anywhere, but it was, it was published in this form, a much longer text than we finally used in uh, the theatre piece, uh, or I should say melodrama. First of all, I should say that um, I approached Christopher Logue out of the blue. He didn't know who on earth I was, and it was one of those moments when I pick up the phone, you know, I catch myself by surprise, and I've got a phone, Peter, got the phone, Christopher Logue, and I'd found his phone number and finally caught myself by surprise, dialing the number, and then I got that wonderful voice at the other end. And I think at first he was rather guarded about uh, the collaboration, but I, as calmly as possible, proposed what the project was going to be, and he agreed. Subsequently, I found out that um, sometime between that and our meeting, he had got in touch with Stanley Myers and checked me out. Um, but I'd known, of course, that he had... I knew Red Bird, and I'd known that he'd collaborated with uh, jazz musicians as early as the 50s. And so I was keen to work with him on a very different sort of project. I had, as Andrew's just said, this commission from Musicon in Durham for a piece to pair with Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale. It seemed at the time that I was writing lots of pieces to pair with pieces that Stravinsky had written because Stravinsky came up with all sorts of weird and wonderful combinations of instruments and, and actors and musicians and so on that uh, called for some kind of collaboration with someone else to you know, to write another piece to make a program possible. Um, the Soldier's Tale was, was written in the First World War, and it was conceived as, as a piece that could be taken on tour um, immediately after the war ended. And of course, the Spanish flu put an end to their tour. But it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it has a narrator, two um, actors, a ballerina, and a little band of seven musicians. So when we got together, Christopher and I decided that we would have to write something which would be non-competitive with Stravinsky and Ramus, um, who wrote the text for Stravinsky. And we conceived of the idea of a melodrama, uh, and we got rid of the ballerina and the two actors and kept the narrator and the musicians. And we opted for the melodrama, which is a notoriously difficult form. Um, there are many casualties through history in this genre, um, pieces that don't work because um, s the, the collaborators haven't, haven't worked out how the, how the music and the, and the words are supposed to interact. So I remember that our conversations, which took place at his place in Notting Hill and mine in West Hampstead, 
um, were mostly technical. And I was trying to um, talk through the problems of notating an actor's part that could be performed with the musicians. And in the end, what happened was that I needed to notate some of the rhythms very precisely against the music. And at other points, the music cues the words or the words cue the music, and there's a, 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 a playful interaction between the two as the piece goes on. In the first instance, we had um, a wonderful actor, Gavin Muir, um, who could read music and um, who learned the part quite easily and performed in the first run. Later on, Neil Cunningham took on the role. But finally, the BBC wanted Christopher to do it for the recording. And it was one of those cases where we had to go back to Newcastle uh, with the Northern Symphonia players. And the BBC had not programmed any rehearsal time for me to work with the musicians and Christopher. So I coached him um, on some of the text, uh, uh, particularly the, the notated text, because he couldn't read music. Um, however, somewhere along the line, a bit of magic happened because, well, I should say that the difficulty along the way was that um, it seemed like a rather unequal relationship in the sense that I could read his words, but he couldn't read my music. And so um, the way it worked was that he, he, he went away for several months, produced the first bit of the text, which gets the the poet into the city and then stopped. And I retreated for several months and wrote the music up to that point. Then we got together again. To our delight, it was actually the golden section in the piece. It's about two thirds of the way through that we'd arrived at. And um, I was trying to make the music palpable to him in whatever way was possible. He never needed to read his text to me. But I found that when we got back into the studio, that I had heard the rhythms which he would use for the text. And so the, the notated part of the score worked pretty well without rehearsal. And uh, that's the magic um, that I think happened in the collaboration. Um, we're going to hear the final minutes of the, the piece. Um, what happens is that the poet arrives in the city and then something appalling happens. He is greeted by uh, a horde of grotesques, um, much more graphic in the original text than, uh, than, than happened in our version of the piece. Um, th th this, this horde is led by a giant 12-foot housewife sitting on a mule, and all kinds of um, grotesques accompany her, including the Kentish leopard, um, and um, they basically run him down and maul him to bits, and he gets older and older and older, and they carry him off into the distance. There's one of those Logian transformations that, uh, that happens to the, the station itself. The station turns into a, a desolate scene uh, with dunes, and uh, you know it seems... Uh, like in the middle of nowhere. And at the very end of the piece, uh, the station returns as, as they've gone into the distance. I should say that um, at, at, at some point along the way, we decided we would embed Christopher in the piece, even though he wasn't narrating it, uh, because we wanted a voice for the housewife, who only says a few things, and indeed the horde. And, and she says, here, young master, here, here. And um, we, we went to John Whiting's studio in Queen Square and recorded Christopher and treated his voice electronically. And the tape part is an integral part of the piece. Um, the, 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 the repetition of here, here becomes a tape loop which runs through almost the, the, the whole of the extract which we're going to hear now. Uh, and that's the echo of the, of the horde crying here, here. It gradually, it gradually disintegrates. But the rhythm of that gave me the tempo and the mood for the music that happens. Christopher left me with the text that ends 
the station's speakers play? And I said to him, what do they play? Uh, and he made one of the musical decisions in the piece at that point. He said, oh, I think it should be Amazing Grace, don't you? And <laughs> uh, so I went, yes. Subsequently, uh, uh, I went to Waterloo Station. What were they playing? Amazing Grace. A few weeks later, I went to Waverley Station, got out of the train there, and uh, yes, it was Amazing Grace with bagpipes to the fore. So that's that's real piped music, if you like. Um, and um, so what I what I conceived of was the kind of sound that you get through station speakers, where sometimes it's impossible to hear exactly what's going on. So there are kind of as it were, several different versions of Amazing Grace amalgamated together, which might clarify or might not. And I've also worked a, a sort of swan song in at the end because I thought the poet had a swan song here. Uh, so there's a little illusion which you may or may not catch. It doesn't matter if you don't. Um, anyway, this is, the, this is the very end of the piece. I think we'll hear it now. Taking the coit from the leopard's mouth, the housewife skates it through the air, over his head, his shoulders, to his waist. And now he cannot move. And now she rides him down. And now they suckle him. And now they lift him up. And now he starts to age. From 25 to 30. Now 35. Now 40. 45. Now 50. 60. 65. I am engaged. Now 70 gone, my mother is alone. Now 80 on and more. And as they lift him up and carry him away, here, here, they cry and move towards the streets. And as they flow away into the streets, all is reaching. Birds, pebbles, kelp, the concourse in its crowds. Boulders and wire, the barrier and its cues, the dune, the train, the rushes, those who board, who close their doors, who sit. And as the train pulls out, the station speakers play. Thank you so much, George. Next up, John Hegley is a poet, performer, and composer. He and Logue got to know each other uh, when Christopher was a guest on John's radio show and they became friends. John's latest collection, A Scarcity of Biscuit, which by the way, seems to me unimprovable as titles go, was the product of his time as poet residence, as poet in residence at Keats House in Hampstead. I don't know if there'll be time today for John to discourse on the relationship between Keats and the custard cream. I suspect not. 
Uh, but I do know his work of Christopher's to perform. So please welcome to the stage, John Hegley. Thank you. Uh, scarcity of biscuit, actually, it's a phrase of John Keats's. It's, it's, um, yeah, uh, Rosemary has asked me to perform three pieces for you. Um, first one starts with a festive tone. Okay, British Library, let's rock. All right, let's not. Oh, come, all ye faithful, here is our cause. All dreams are one dream. All wars, civil wars. Lovers have never found agony strange. We who hate change survive only through change. Those who are sure of love do not complain For sure of love is sure Love comes again Um, uh, my partner Mel brought round uh, to Rosemary, actually, uh, a Yule Logue. Um, <laughs> talking of sweet, uh, sweet things. Uh, okay, um, so the next piece, um, I actually was, uh, came by uh, bus uh, today from um, Hackney. And um, at the bus stop, I met Kath, a friend of mine. And I, she said, well, where are you going? And I said, I was coming to read uh, some pieces um, for Christopher. And uh, she didn't know Christopher Logue. And so I started to read her this, and then the 476 came along, so I didn't get to finish it. Um, but you get it in its entirety. Uh, this is the aardvark. Uh, and there's, a, uh, there's two bits in it which are newspaper headlines, so I'll go like that when it's the newspaper headlines. Into the moonlit midnight, out of his stateless hole, set for an insect intake, a common aardvark stall. Depict this common aardvark, globe eyes of fiery rose, long of tail, of tongue, of ear, yet longer still of nose. He sniffs the ermine moonshine, he hears the vermin snore. Brisk as a whip, the aardvark's tongue streaks from the aardvark's maw. Gigantic lick, snuffs glowworm. <laughs> Midge cloud, engulfed, mid-air. Followed by a thousand ants, an aardvark's normal fare. A myriad of rotifers cruising a humid knit, another half a thousand ants to keep him fat but fit. An ounce of infant locusts, a cache of millipedes, another half a thousand ants, and then, then he needs rest on the trek through hunger to woo his mortal soul meekly the common aardvark goes back into his hole <laughs> the aardvark <laughs> uh, and um, th 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 my, my last uh, piece of Christopher's um, yeah my, and, my, and Christopher was a, supported me and encouraged me and inspired me and I'm great grateful um, this is uh, yeah 
A blues in G. Last night in London Airport, I saw a little bin labeled unwanted literature to be placed herein. And so I wrote a poem and popped it in. Merci, Christopher Logue. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, John Hagley. No scarcity of biscuit or any scarcity of any kind there. Rosemary Hill is a cultural historian with a special interest in the 19th and 20th centuries, and she's a contributing editor to the London Review of Books. She's the author of God's Architect, the biography of Pugin, which received many prizes, Rain Downer actually prizes, I won't go through them all, but it included the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Her latest book, Time's Witness, History in the Age of Romanticism, has been a book of the year this year. She's a fellow of All Souls College. She met Christopher in 1983 when she published some of his poems in Country Life magazine, where Rosemary was then the poetry editor. They were married in 1985. Please welcome to the stage, Rosemary Hill. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I didn't tell Christopher to ring up and apologize to Lucinda. Um, he did say to me once, after some similar incident, I'm very good at apologizing, and I may have said you ought to be, you've had enough practice. <laughs> um, well, if, I think we've got a picture actually of some files which we could have now, there we are. Um, if every exit is an entrance somewhere else, then the reverse is also true. And so as Christopher arrives here at the library in the form of his archive, he is also in another way left home. The librarians came on Tuesday to the house in Camberwell, which he and I shared for most of the 27 years of our marriage. And somewhere on the journey from SE5 to NW1, he and his archive have undergone a change. At home, the notes for war music have for many years occupied two shelves in the downstairs front room in a somewhat motley and bumped at the corners series of files and ring binders. Some writers prefer, indeed some writers insist, on having identical notebooks, but Christopher's love of stationery was as Catholic as it was passionate. And there are binders in many colors, and there's one which has got a very, or had originally, it's very faded now, of a sort of cheery design in candy-colored shapes, which is clearly meant to encourage that back-to-school excitement. <laughs> um, but the one I like best, which he labeled General, has Mickey Mouse on the front and on the back um, against a dazzling array of polka dots and stripes. And it contains a selection of things. I say he labeled it General, so it's a selection of things that he thought might come in handy at various points in the poem. There are newspaper cuttings with startling headlines, and as we've heard all the way through, he was always attracted to newspaper headlines. Um, he put them in poems, like the one that John's just read, um, and he put them into his fairly true stories in Private Eye. And the stories that he kept for use potentially in war music included Radiation panic in Greece. Life in the fun lane begins with your own set of wheels. Lemmings are not suicidal, just hungry. <laughs> Fleas unfairly blamed for black death. Um, and there are off prints as well of learned articles, including the chariot right at Onkestos. There are sections within the Mickey Mouse folder, um, quite neatly arranged, about thunder, landslips, 
dust, there's a whole section on dust, two chapters from a book about stuntmen, and there's one small yellowing clipping that clearly came from a story that didn't make the front page, and it covers the Dutch Defence Ministry's debriefing report after the fall of Srebrenica, and it describes how the Dutch soldiers inside their armoured personnel characters ca inside their armoured personnel carriers heard soft repeated bangs as the fleeing Muslims were crushed under their wheels. Christopher saw in Homer a way of refracting the horror of war, a bit like Perseus using his shield to avoid looking at Medusa. Um, he wanted you to be able to see the violence without being blinded, but never to have it blunted. And all of this stuff is held together with glue, interleaved and annotated with post-it notes, as we saw earlier, um, and here and there he's used a paper clip. And so somewhere along the Euston Road, this cheerful, homely assemblage of work in progress has been transformed into an archivist's nightmare. <laughs> or at least, if not a nightmare, certainly a challenge. The conservation of the post-it note is now, I am reliably informed, a thing. And of course, home is different too. There are empty shelves, and there is nothing that a freelance historian and bookworm such as myself likes more than an empty shelf. <laughs> so in a way, I'm thrilled, and also, in a way, I'm sad. As a historian, you find that the past changes as rapidly as the present and in direct relation to it. As you travel through time, as when you travel through space, the view changes. Some things look smaller, others loom larger, and, a certain, and at a certain point you see, in the rear view mirror, as it were, your own past self. My life with Christopher is also bound up among the clippings. When I met him in the 1980s, he hadn't done any work on war music for some years. He'd been depressed and he'd lost momentum, and I think he might not have gone back to it if I hadn't introduced him to Craig Rain who was my former boss on the short-lived but absolutely brilliant literary magazine Quarto. And Craig, by then, was the poetry editor at Faber's. And by the end of what was, even for the 1980s, an epic lunch, um, Christopher had been persuaded to return to Homer. <coughs> and there were some other smaller bits of our life in there. Once I asked Christopher, who was going into town, to get me a lipstick... Um, and he was the sort of man who would do that. He didn't mind. He wasn't one of those men who, if you ask them to hold your handbag, holds it like an unexploded bomb. He was very relaxed around women and things to do with women. And he said, yes, of course, what's it called? And I said, it's called All Day Permanent Red. And we looked at each other and we thought, there's a title. <laughs> um, and indeed, it became the title of his version of books five and six of war music. But there was, of course, as we've been hearing, much more to Christopher's work than war music. His heyday, and Tarek talked about this wonderfully, in terms of productivity was in the 60s because he loved the sense of possibility, which Tarek evokes so well. You could do posters, you could do plays, you could do films. And the great Albert Hall poetry reading um, was got off the ground with a very few people. And to publicise it, um, Christopher's friend, Kenny Carter, an antique dealer in the Portobello Road, got hold um, of a tank from Army Surplus, covered it in posters and drove it through the centre of London. You couldn't do that now. <laughs> um, and then there were the protests, and Christopher continued to be a great protester. He was deeply opposed to the Iraq War and asked rather wistfully if there's going to be a demo. Um, and, of course, there was, but by then he wasn't strong enough to march, and it must be admitted that Christopher was never very keen on the actual marching. <laughs> and he did admit to me, under close questioning, that on the Aldermaston marches, he and Ken Tynan went quite a lot of the way in a taxi. Yes. Um, and he was also, he was in Grosvenor Square for the great um, anti-Vietnam war protest, but he spent a lot of the time up a tree. Um, it's surprisingly quick at things like that. Um, but although he was in Grosvenor Square, he was never anti-American, 
and he was impatient with those who were. His activism continued. He sat outside this library in the Euston Road, reading I shall vote Labour into the thunder of the traffic as part of a protest against the detention of Mordecai Vanunu. But he was never anti-Israel. What interested him, what puzzled and indeed to some extent obsessed him, the theme of a lot of his writing was the human condition. Why do people do these things? Why is there an atom bomb? Why is there cruelty to animals? It's too easy to blame a government or a nation or the forces of the establishment, which are all just expressions of the same problem. This was at the root of his exasperation with Christianity, its promise of a happy ending, a benign God, ultimate justice. The Greeks had many gods, and none of them were reliably benign. Um, and an underlying theme in his poetry, because of course I've looked at it to prepare for this event in a way that I'd never quite looked at it before. Um, theme, one theme is this endless damage that human greed does, not just to ourselves, but to what these days we quite often refer to as the planet. And so just before I finish, I'm going to read one of his less known poems. It sometimes said he suppressed this. He didn't suppress it, but it was on a poster which had so many spelling mistakes on it. Christopher took a relaxed view of spelling, but there were limits. So this poster has not been circulated. And it's called Selene's Anthem. Selene is the Greek moon goddess, the daughter of the Titans. From the painted caves of Lascaux to the bounds of outer space, what species goes so fast, so far as the mighty human race? And the animals cooperate in man's exalted feats. The stronger ones he puts to work, and the weaker ones he eats. <laughs> on the right hand, private enterprise. On the left, the nine year plan. Marching onward through the universe goes the family of man. The last film that Christopher saw as it happened was Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris. And as I was driving him home, I asked him what he thought of it. And he went like that, which he often did. He meaning kind of okay, but not great. And I said, but the filming of Paris was very good, wasn't it? Did it not make you nostalgic for when you lived there? And there was a bit of a silence from the passenger seat. And then he said, you know, my darling, I don't really do nostalgia. <laughs> and I said, I know, and that's why I love you. So now as we go marching on with Christopher into his archival afterlife, I hope that you will carry some of that spirit with you. Thank you. Perfect, Rosemary. Thank you so much. So, everybody... The poet has truly arrived in the library. <laughs> this is a place of learning, and uh, we've learned so much today. Um, I personally now know that next time I need a lipstick, I'll be able to ask um, Rosemary to go into town and get it for me without being judged, <laughs> which is really useful. Um, it's been a stellar and adorable cast. This has been put together very quickly, and I want to thank all of you for the brilliance of your readings and performances. You heard at the beginning from Astrid Williamson. I'm very excited to be able to tell you something about Astrid before inviting her to close events today. I've been a fan of hers for a long time. You heard her sing Be Not Too Hard, which was Donovan's setting of September song, by the way. She's from the Shetlands. Astrid was founding member of indie, indie trio Goya Dress and has subsequently released eight albums. The first, Guy Addresses Rooms, was produced by the legendary John Cale of the Velvet Underground. Over the years, she's collaborated as a vocalist with many artists, including Johnny Bar Marr and Bernard Sumner in their um, stage as Electronic and the Stereophonics. Our next album, Into the Mountains, will be released in February 2022, so soon. She'll play several live dates in the UK alongside the album re re release, so we'll keep it locked for that. It's lovely of you to have come today. It's great to look at your faces. Please welcome back to the stage, Astrid Williams.
Thank you, Andrew. That was lovely. I didn't expect to have my, my schedule expressed. Um, I'll just check that we're in the right key. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, you might well wonder what I'm sticking to this keyboard right now. Um, the song I'm about to finish off with is... Uh, let's just check that I am. Yes, it is. I'm sure it's done it for me. I'll just do that transpose button, yes. It's a song called Bellini, which I am promised a Bellini after this, thank God. Um, but it's got such a cast of characters. I, I, when I try and memorize things, I, I sometimes do ca cartoons because the little pictures stick in my mind. And I have it on good authority, even though I never had the, the fortune to meet Christopher Logue. Uh, I have it on good authority. He would imp approve of my cartoon cheat sheet we have here. So, um, and, and Mickey Mouse made a, a, an appearance um, in Rosemary's <laughs> um, reading. So, this is called Bellini, and as I say, I am not a jazz singer, but I'm going to really give it my best. It was Annie Ross did it originally, um, and it's, uh, please imagine a jazz trio if you possibly can.
Mr. Williamson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, Head of Events here at the British Library. Great to see you all. There's merchandise outside, both books and posters. Thank you once again. <laughs>